Let me start off the, you know, with a summary of what I saw happening in the stock market this week. I put out a video every day. Uh, this week I was actually on vacation Monday through Wednesday, uh, but normally we have a video coming out and then we do a summary on Friday. So I'll start uh, with that. <clears throat> Here's our chart. We've been looking at this chart for quite some time. This is going back to 2018. I can see the pandemic, the big run up after the pandemic, you know, all these things. So if you look at what's going on here most recently, you know, we've almost fully recovered. Um, actually, this is a weekly chart and it looks like we have fully recovered on a weekly basis. But when you look at a daily chart, we actually had the 16th of July. Uh, we hit 56.67, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, we're within a percent of that. And so that's what we're trying to do right now, basically, is trying to get to a new all-time high to kind of solidify this recovery so we don't say, oh, you know, we went up and then we came back down uh, and kind of created this double top. Uh, and really, if you look at the charts, you know, on a daily or hourly basis, you can see we just keep bouncing up yeah. against, you know, within a percent of that all-time high and then kind of coming back down or what have you too. So, uh, but this is a very strong recovery, uh, just like the one we had in May from the downturn that happened in April. Uh, these are not completely normal. Uh, last year was more normal where we had that downturn and several you know jumps up that were fake moves until yeah. we finally got to the bottom. Uh, we are having these V recoveries, which just shows the strength of the market right now. Uh, and there's a reason for it being strong. And we'll talk about that as we go here. But and of course, you know, what we look at, primary direction, part of that is higher lows presented this last week. Uh, and, you know, still trying to get through to that new all-time high, that line at the top there. So mm -hmm. that's, that's preserving that, you know, primary direction to the up means continuing to stay above that last arrow there, basically, at this point in time. In this function, we look at other pieces also, uh, the 50-day and the 200-day moving average and those types of things too. But... Uh, this is an easy one for everybody to kind of see and understand. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, so we have our, you know, primary trends here, uh, just kind of looking at, you know, the different portions of time for the S&P 500, the hourly chart, the daily, the weekly, the monthly. And you can see back in July 18th, the hourly actually went negative and, and we ended up with a pretty good size downturn. We were 8.5% mm -hmm. uh, down from our high. And then that on August 15th, uh, you know, exactly, uh, almost exactly a month later, we came back to positive and everything's green at the moment. Uh, there hasn't been a change since June 3rd uh, on the uh, market breadth indicators where we're looking at some of the very big, broad ETFs <clears throat> and some of the uh, more narrow ones that are in specific industries like semiconductors, utilities, and transportation, which are, you know, if you're going to look at eight, th these are not bad right here. Yeah, and they're, they're slower moving because we're using weekly data. Yes, that's right. We're looking for a more of a major trend change when we're looking at that portion of the data. It's not meant to be a um, pre-indicator um, of yeah, downturn. Indicator. Yeah, it's really just sort of a, how bad is this, you know? I mean, so yeah, the market's down like it was. It was down 8%. None of these turned. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's just a kind of a confirmation for how bad because what we look at for downturns, you know, we'd rather the market just went up every day. It would make our job a lot easier, make mm -hmm. everybody's job. Probably wouldn't have a job if it went up every day. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so but we don't worry that much about these smaller downturns, you know, the five, 10 you know, percent downturns that happen, you know, 10 percent downturn on average happens once a year. So, you know, that. Type of thing. So what we're really worried about is that kind of 20, 30, 40, you know, 50 percent downturns. And so this, well, that's what that market breadth is for, just to kind of show us, you know, how bad things are getting. Uh, and, you know, is it going across the board or is it just certain uh, segments uh, or not? And so anyway, that's uh, been everything's good. Right. As far as that goes. Uh, and <clears throat> today we had the core uh, uh, PCE, actually the PCE, both core and, you know, headline uh, inflation number what came out. So basically it always comes out essentially the last day of the month uh, for yeah, well, the month prior yeah uh, so it's very late we get CPI first immediately followed by PPI which is wholesale inflation uh, both were decent uh, yeah. and, um, and and then PCE though is the most important because this is what the Fed looks at mm -hmm. yeah. right so a little hard to see this but it's a 2.62 percent uh, that's essentially exactly the same that has been for the last three months 2.6 percent yeah there's, there's another <clears throat> quite flat report yeah it'd be better if it was coming down uh, honestly uh, you know the fed is trying to get that to two percent uh 
and but it's not coming up and so you know the, sort of a neutral indicator for the market at this point in time yeah, yeah shelter shelter's been kind of that sticky point um for inflation so um I think it was up 0.4% month over month. Month over month. So if you annualize that out, that's 4.8%, which is a lot higher than we're seeing in the yeah. other overall inflationary yeah. numbers. Yeah, that is the big driver. It's still it's still rents basically, you know, being high and going up uh, that is still driving, you know, the inflation numbers, uh, which is kind of fascinating. Uh, I, you know, there's lots of reasons that that happens. Uh, but mainly it's usually a supply and demand thing where, you know, there just aren't enough spaces for rent uh, for the number of people that want to rent them. It's gotten so expensive to buy a home. I mm -hmm. think that's one of the bigger drivers. And especially when you raise, you know, mortgage rates from 3% to 6 or 7 makes it even more expensive to buy that home. And so more people looking towards rent uh, as far as that goes. So anyway, this is a good number. <clears throat> There's two things that the market's looking at right now is inflation and recession. Mm -hmm. And we basically have good news this week on both. Inflation's doing well. I mean, it's definitely overall on that trend chart looks good. Uh, yeah. The last three years here, it's coming down. Uh, you got to keep coming down, you know, so we watch that, but th that's good news. And then the second thing that we got was the uh, revised gross domestic product for the second quarter. So this is going back. Um, you know, several years here, looking at 2023 and the first half of this year, we're doing pretty well. Yeah. I mean, those are, those are good numbers, you know, <clears throat> two plus percent. First quarter of this year was at 1.4%. Uh, uh, so, you know, it's a little lower. You know, we're a big economy. Uh, you can get smaller economies that can get big numbers. I remember China used to run in that kind of seven to nine percent for a long time. Uh, not, they're, they're struggling to get there at this point, but um, they revised it from 2.8 to 3, which the market, I think, liked this week. Yeah. We saw some good motion from that. But we're, we're worried about recession and we're worried about inflation. Inflation's coming down. The gross domestic product is a, you know, kind of a one number, you know, all encompassing concept of looking at how the economy's doing. We're not having a recession. Theoretically, uh, not theoretically, but actually a recession is two negative GDP quarters in a row mm -hmm. or more. Yeah. Uh, and there's a board that decides that and they've got other factors that they look at. And you don't find out that there was an official recession from that board until six to 12 months later, which is kind of weird. But the market is really looking at those two pieces. And the beginning of this month, you know, we dropped eight and a half percent from our high. Uh, it, it, partly in July, but certainly here in August. And, and we ended up up for the month in the end, but the downturn was at least partly um, some of the data that was coming out mm -hmm. was a little bit weak. Uh, on, uh, the job market was looking weaker. You know, we got up to 4.3% unemployment, right? Um, and so it worried about recession, but uh, I don't know. I don't see it happening here. Uh, you know, we have so much momentum and the stock market is an early indicator it's a leading indicator mm -hmm. and if the stock market is showing strength it's because they it, it sees strength in the next three to 18 months in the economy which means theoretically overall strength in earnings right and that's the key that's the driver i mean if you want to pick out one thing that drives the market it's very heavily correlated to earnings uh, overall and uh so <clears throat> This is another report that just came out today just on uh, personal consumption uh, continues to just skyrocket. It's doing really, really well uh, coming out of the pandemic. Uh, people are spending money uh, and even to the point where, you know, savings rates at 2.9%. Uh, that's not terrible, actually. Long term, we're, we're right around there. Yeah, we were in historic highs during the pandemic. Yes. Yeah. Partly because there was a historically high amount of money being pushed out to the public, too, you know, so. Uh, and then, you know, it was a little hard to spend money for a while uh, mm -hmm. of any yeah. substance, couldn't go out and do things, uh, uh, even st struggle to order things uh, to for, for a little while, especially, you know, uh, goods and such, too. So, um, you know, the U.S. always has a relatively low savings rate. If you look at some of these other, like, smaller economies, uh, emerging markets, you can see savings rates that are much higher. Uh, one of the reasons and the difference is that, you know, in those markets, they don't have the same safety nets. Uh, and often they don't maybe have a social security type system. They don't have a Medicare, you know, type system in place. Uh, and so people are saving more to take care of themselves, uh, you know, in that case of, you know, retirement or emergency and medical and such. 
uh, where here we have the safety nets that allow people to, you know, save less uh, mm-hmm. as far as that goes. So that's another good driver. It's, you know, again, you look at that chart, we're not going to see a recession anytime soon with this type of, you know, personal consumption growth. Uh, even the disposable income is growing also. So what that means is that income is growing faster than the rate of inflation, which has really been a nice thing. Uh, and it just gives more and more disposable income to go out and spend, and that stimulates the economy. And there's a lot of people very concerned about inflation and how much things have you know, increased in cost, rightfully so. Um, but what, what is happening on the back end of that is that in, you know we've seen a big increase in wages um, to offset that. And so things are, unfortunately, it's not, everybody right i mean no. it, you could be sitting there with you know uh, a fixed income and watching you know your grocery bill skyrocket and you're not getting anything but overall as far as the country goes you know we're seeing more income come in than we're seeing increase in price across the board now your situation might be different but but the market looks at the whole thing yeah yeah and so that's why we're doing well now all of this says to me that the fed is unlikely to do a two rate cut you know a half a point instead of a quarter point right and this is we've shared this chart before this is a little hard to see there's a lot of little data points on here but this is a great tool it's called the cme fed watch uh, tool Uh, this is where you can go to see kind of you know what the bet is from the market uh, yeah so these are basically the future contracts on the the rates yeah and so uh, again a little hard to see uh, but the the it's we're at what sixty nine and a half percent bet that there'll be a core point rate cut yeah right and zero bet that will stay the same <laughs> yeah so it's a hundred percent now this was also confirmed by the Jackson Hole speech that you know Chairman Powell gave here in August who said they're looking to do a rate cut so yeah you know I mean there's it's going to be one now the the second uh, column there the smaller one is for a half a point rate cut. Mm-hmm. That's currently at 30.5%. Uh, that was at 36% a week ago. Yeah, but if you were thinking about a month ago, it was all the way down in 13%. Yeah, and so it, it came up as we saw that weaker data come mm-hmm. out, yeah. and now it's coming back down again. You know, they revised the GDP, they show this personal consumption uh, pieces, you know, the uh, PCE index didn't go up, you know, it's flat. Uh, and so I don't think we're going to see a half a point rate cut. Uh, and, and there's been a lot of articles about that, you know, happening. I, I don't see it. Uh, they, you know, they meet the September 18th. It's not yeah. that long from now. There won't be enough data points, I think, to change that. Um, so I think they'll do a measured cut. There's also some political pressure. I've, I've heard, you know, several different Fed governors saying that politics never comes up in the room, so to speak, when they're deciding on different things. Uh, and, you know, one uh, woman, um, uh, what was her name? Lynn Baird, I think her name was. She's been in a couple hundred uh, and she'd never heard. So, however, um, there is pressure, you know, to to not affect the outcome of an election mm-hmm. so again i think that also leads more towards a quarter point rate cut uh than than a half the next meeting is the 7th of november um and so that's after the election so they can kind of do whatever they want at that yeah. point at least from a political standpoint but i do think we're going to see a, a quarter point uh, rate cut here so i think that's important uh, and just some quick data here just on you know uh historical performance uh, we got the Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ here, uh, basically from 71 to last year. How did the end of the year go? So from Labor Day, which is what, Monday, huh, mm-hmm. to the end of the year, uh, the average performance, if you look across there, is what, 2.7 to 3.4%, right? That's pretty good. Uh, I take that uh, as far as that goes. Uh, 72 to 68% of the time, it's been up uh, and higher. Uh, if you look at that, you know, data across those uh, pieces too, and I think that's spectacular. So, you know, again, this is a time frame where uh, the market can do fairly well throughout the rest of this year, combined with the strength of the market that we already have. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, this all flies in the face of article after article that I keep reading, talking about the big crash that's going to come or what have you. I've been reading that all the way through this upturn. I've been reading that my whole career, actually. Unfortunately, negative sells. It just Mm -hmm. does. I mean, if you want to start a newsletter and you want to get some subscribers or you want to get clicks on your website, uh, you would talk about crashes and because fear is a much more powerful emotion. Yeah, but there has been a shift away from it. You know, inflation now, but now right. it's kind of shifting towards recession. Yeah, is the new fear. That's right. It's all the same in a way. Um, 
I, you know, it's kind of funny because there are some people that are kind of famous for calling these tops. Uh, uh, Peter Schiff is one, for example. So if you go look up Peter Schiff, you know, he called the top in 2008 and he called the top in real estate. But if you go look at his, uh, you know, information, he's calling the top essentially on a daily basis. Um, and so, you know, you're bound to, you know, what is a stuck clock is right twice a day you know, type of thing. And so you're bound to like <laughs> get right. And so you get some fame for that. But when you really look at it, you're not doing anything, honestly. As a matter of fact, you're probably wildly underperforming if you're listening to that on all of the other days, mm -hmm. uh, for example. Uh, so uh, now this is the last thing here that I think is very fascinating. This just came out today uh, in Market Watch. It's uh, from Hubert Ratings. And uh you're just showing that going, and this is going back to 1896, and this is the Dow, right? Yeah, it's a little bit hard to get data for election years. There's yes. There's only so many election years. Yeah. When you're doing data analysis, you want as many data points as you can get to a certain degree. I'm sure there's some limit to that. I'm not an expert at that. But the elections only happen every four years. And so, you know, uh, it's a bit more... This, I would say this data can be a bit more suspect just because yeah. there aren't as many data points. But at least this one does go back to 1896. And what they're showing is the average rate of return by month. So the kind of the, I don't know, that bluish green uh, bar is every year. And then, the, you know, the orange bar is for presidential election years. And you can see it's actually quite different than the average. Uh, but uh, if we look at August as the best month, uh, we didn't have the best month so okay. far. This we had, we're up about 1.6 percent. Not bad, uh, considering we were down a bunch at the beginning and yeah. recovered so quickly to end up positive. I, I, I'm, I'm impressed. Uh, however, I think September is the most interesting one. So on average, you can tell September is the biggest down month, about 1.1 percent negative over this course of time um, on the Dow, right? S&P, I believe, going back, uh, I think it was going back to 1970 for that data set we were looking at some time ago. It was down 0.6%, also yeah. September. And and then the S&P in that data set, the only month that was down was September. Now, there's a couple of others here. If you see uh, February and April are historically down long term. Uh, but what it does show there is that September in an election year is slightly up. Uh, on average, which I think is really interesting. And, and of course, it just continues to ramp into October and then November is huge. Mm -hmm. And it's less in December, mainly because I think it just runs so hard in November. It just doesn't have anything left to kind of keep going, but uh, all positive. So it kind of fits in with the narrative that we just looked at. You know, after Labor Day, market is positive on average. If you look at the average, you know, election year cycle, September, October, November, December, all positive, yep. right? And uh, some of them fairly high. Uh, I think that's about 2.4%, give or take, 2.3% uh, uh, on in November, uh, which is great. So you really want to hang in there throughout this time frame. You know, we're not a big believer kind of, you know, moving in and out, but there is a seasonal aspect to the next month. Um, however, some of that could be offset by the election itself, and obviously by the rate cut that's probably going to happen yep. on September 18th. So anyway, uh, really fascinating time frame to be an investor, and I think that there's some really uh, some good things to look at here uh, and you know continue. Now, we have made some changes even today to our portfolio. Uh, we uh, have moved out of our utility positions. Uh, you know, we have this, you know, basically big list of, of we're looking for momentum and utilities are still doing fairly well, but not as well as some of the other areas. And the areas that we are into right now are healthcare, uh, real estate. Uh, there's a minimum volatility um, ETF, USMV, uh, that iShares puts out. And it's kind of interesting. It basically just looks for stocks that have less volatility and puts them into one big basket. Uh, and, uh, and technology would be other, you know, component across our you know universe of models that we deal with uh and you know that's working out pretty well but it is interesting to me you know because we basically just follow this momentum that there is a fair amount of momentum in things that are not tech mm -hmm. right we yeah. were heavily tech when that things were highly moving in tech even at the beginning of this year and we're starting to see more momentum coming out of some other areas lower volatility of people are a little worried about what might happen uh, real estate healthcare. these are I wouldn't call them completely defensive categories because uh, utilities are also, but they are not tech, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so I, I think that's an interesting shift that's happening right now. I don't know if that'll continue. You know, we'll see what goes on. Uh, you know, people are kind of gearing up for, you know, possible <clears throat> issues that might happen in September or whatever, right? And I, I mean, one of the things that you might do, uh, you know, in theoretically, 
you still want to stay in the market, yep. right? You don't want to get out of market. Your primary trends up. And so sometimes what you can do is you can rotate and, and, and ratchet back the volatility of your portfolio. So you got utilities and real estate and healthcare, those types of things that don't move as fast, right? And so if you're if the if the volatility absolutely turns to be up, you're still in. You're still going to make something. You may not make as much as some of the high flying stuff in a high in an upward mo motion market, maybe small caps or tech or whatever it might mm -hmm. be. Um, but we are seeing a rotation in the market into less volatile non tech areas. That that's for sure. Well, we'll see if that continues, but it's something to be aware of. Uh, matter of fact, that rotation has been violent enough, in my opinion, and even short enough, like the small cap run we had. Yeah. And then, you know, I mean, even this week we had a day where the market was down and small caps were up. And, you know, so I would own everything. And that's, uh, that's our advocation is that you should have probably about three quarters of your portfolio in the broad market pieces, you know, the, that it incorporates pretty much all of the stocks or all of the different types mm -hmm. of stocks, market cap. In this environment, that's a really good place to be because the money is just kind of rotating around. It's trying to find a footing, in my opinion. We haven't really, we had a very strong tech trend uh, has now changed into um, a decent tech trend uh, combined with a lot of other things moving around. Uh, and I think it's trying to find its way. And if the market's going to do that, just hold on to the whole thing for the most part. Um, so anyway, that's our summary for the week. Uh, thank everybody for you know joining us for that. I look forward to doing this again next week.